You are listening to Concussion 101, a patient's guide to getting ahead again. Episode 4, To Rest or Not to Rest. Your host, Ms. Caitlin Haino, occupational therapist at the York Region Concussion Clinic, is back again in this episode to address the controversial question of rest after a concussion and to explain the principles of energy management. Enjoy. Welcome to our fourth podcast. We spoke about sleep. We addressed that old piece of advice regarding lying in a dark room, but we have yet to cover energy and rest. For those of you that don't recognize my voice at this point, I'm Dr. Chuck, the medical director of YRCC, and I'll be interviewing Caitlin, our OT. Let's start simple. Should I rest after a concussion? All right, so imagine breaking your leg. If you never rest, if you just keep running on it, you're not giving it a chance to heal. The brain works the same way. You need that initial period of complete rest. In my experience, it's all about finding that balance, the balance between rest and activity. Initially, for the first few days, complete rest is recommended. Can you give us a better idea of what a few means? Right. Some literature, like the Ontario Neurotrauma Foundation guidelines, says to limit this to one to two days, whereas the recent CDC guidelines um, for managing traumatic brain injuries in children, that says several days. Evidence supporting the ideal complete rest strategy isn't really there yet. It, for example, like specifics, how long we should rest, what is rest, who does this work for, and which patients should be given other recommendations, and so on. Practically speaking, the goal is to make an effort to move on past that complete rest period expeditiously, and to not stay parked in that complete rest phase for a prolonged length of time. You know, what we hear, that whole, I spent three weeks in a dark room sort of thing. Right. The, the help of healthcare providers trained in managing this injury can help a lot with those recommendations. And even in the spirit, oftentimes the complete rest period that patients take has more to do with practical considerations than their symptoms. Exactly. Things like how long it takes them to get into a clinic to get assessed, uh, or if they have a school plan in place, sometimes even whether the injury took place on a Thursday or a Monday, or if it aggravated pre-existing medical issues, and so on, right? Now, rest used to be the cornerstone of treatment. Patients used to be told to rest until their symptoms were gone. Right. There is there is definitely a role for complete rest initially. So that's what we mentioned there. Those first uh, one to two or several days, right? So after that first initial period of rest, you need to start doing a little bit more. In that first podcast you mentioned, uh, concussion creating an energy deficit in the brain. Also, uh, rest protects the brain from subsequent injury, including that second impact syndrome that you talked about before as well. But... There is a difference between total rest for a prolonged time, which is not helpful, and limited and cautious rest, which is important for neurological recovery. For this podcast, let's let's label that relative rest, because you're doing less than you used to do before your injury. So that relative rest, that doesn't mean doing nothing or lying in a dark room, as so many people think. Correct. That seems cruel, to ask someone to do nothing at all. I mean, you can't turn off your brain. If there's nothing going on, your mind is going to run wild and fill that emptiness, that lack of stimulus from the environment, with anything and everything anyways. So by rest, I mean quiet activity. Do something that does not make your symptoms worse. So what sort of things can we do in relative rest? That quiet activity could be anything that is not uh, more cognitively or physically demanding than you can handle. So common examples that I give people are things like listen to music or audiobooks or even concussion podcasts <laughs> or uh, have a short conversation with a friend or a family member maybe art painting knitting those adult coloring books maybe meditation have a long bath and relax Th- that being said it's different for everyone what would you advise for people who have visual challenges post concussion so i would definitely avoid anything too visually demanding like screens and reading especially in those first few days about two-thirds to three-quarters of patients have visual consequences from their concussions so i mean essentially avoid anything stressful try not to do too much housework even if you feel having the day off means you need to catch up on that to-do list so in general use your symptoms as a guideline if you're doing something we suggested like painting but your symptoms increase maybe it's not right for you Can you discuss what that Concussion and Sport Group International Consensus Statement from last year said? 
you know, about rest? Right. It says that there's insufficient evidence that prescribing complete rest does promote recovery from concussion. A systematic review, which is a type of study that looks at all the research out there, it takes that high quality stuff and then provides a summary of the literature. So a systematic review from this year found that lifestyle balance really is key. So either extreme, that strict rest, or the immediate return to activity, both of those resulted in a poorer outcome than those individuals that had that balanced or medium level of activity. How can too much rest work against concussion patients? There's so many reasons. Uh, first, because it's not promoting ideal neurological performance. If you rest too long, that becomes your new normal. So an analogy I like to give is this one. Everyone's been to a movie theater in the middle of the day. When you come out, when you see that light, it's just blinding. Now imagine not just spending two hours, but spending days or weeks in the dark. That's what your brain adapts to. It becomes your new normal. It's sort of the same after concussion for other cognitive and physiological processes too. Too much rest can be quite harmful. It's like uh, snakes and ladders. We need to find a ladder to pick ourselves back up rather than just parking ourselves on that board. Why does that happen? You know, processes we don't use get a little rusty. Ah, uh, well, for survival, adaptation. We know that the brain is plastic, and plastic means that it has the ability to reorganize itself and make new connections. We strengthen those neural connections that we use frequently. So one of my favorite quotes is from Donald Hebb, neurons that fire together, wire together. That's one of your favorite quotes. I like it. He's Canadian. It's cool research. So I guess this is why you can learn a language or learn how to use computer technology at any age. Right. So the opposite is also true. Our brains downgrade a lot of those connections that don't get used. Imagine your brain like a computer. If you find that your computer is starting to slow down, you start looking for things to delete. If you're not using a certain program or you really don't want those vacation pictures with your ex, you delete them. Your brain does the same thing. It's an oversimplification, but essentially, if you don't use it, you lose it. Absolutely. Are there other factors that are not in favor of extended periods of complete rest? Recent evidence from a randomized controlled trial, so another type of research, uh, it showed that strict rest beyond two days prolonged symptomatic recovery from concussion. So this was consistent with the observation that removing athletes from regular physical activity, it's detrimental to their mental health. We see that happen quite often. Right. So you're, I'm an OT, so I have to say this, your occupations, your activities give you purpose, meaning, identity, positive reinforcement, social connections. If you withdraw from all those things that you love and mean something to you, this could contribute to anxiety or depression. So you mentioned physical activity. What about when to start mental activities? Some recent studies are suggesting that early cognitive tasks, and when I say early, I mean just days after the injury, might be able to help patients get ready for school or work sooner. As an occupational therapist, the first question I'm usually asked is, how soon can I return to work? Or when can I go back to gymnastics? Or can I go back to school again? It's actually really hard for me when I have to tell someone that it might be longer that they, than they expect. Actually, I usually make someone else on our team do it. Well, let me guess who. <laughs> yeah. Well, the point is that rest takes you away from what you value. So it can be very harmful to your mental health. All right. So to summarize... We know that we should completely rest for only a few days and try to move on from that stage as expeditiously as possible, and that usually guidance is best provided by the healthcare team. Prolonged and indiscriminate rest strategies actually risk prolonging our recovery and increasing symptom severity in many patients. Got it. So what happens after this period of time? Well, that has a pretty involved answer, because it varies so much depending on that individual's unique profile of symptoms and circumstances. My best recommendation is to consult a physician and your multidisciplinary healthcare team, including OTs like myself. Generally, what we recommend is actually quite intuitive, but the details may not be. So generally, expect to be off work or sports or school. When we get people back to activity, we go back gradually. So maybe after that period of absence initially, we'll go back with part-time hours or we'll start with just a few classes. But it really does depend on the individual. An analogy we give is that if you have an energy budget, you want to keep some for daily expenditures. This is like the task you have to do every day. And we want to save some for investment. That would be like rehabilitation strategies. Eventually, investments will give you returns and you can use them to increase your daily budget. I like that analogy. And remember that rehabilitation in this context is quite broad, but generally it can refer to any move that you make that uh, upgrades your internal software. So this could take the form of active physical therapy to learn better strategies to use your neurophysiology or uh, strategically exposing yourself to cognitive tasks at work or school. 
or even learning to relax, which is the topic of our next episode. Or uh, rehab can be those gains that you make while doing therapeutic activities, like learning a language or chess moves. Likewise, things that we gradually increase are things like the the demand on cognition, energy, heart rate, visual system, the vestibular involvement, demand on those systems when we get people back into activity. Again, it's all about going back gradually. Yes. You want to expose yourself to environments and activity at an ideal pace so that you don't overdo it and risk a prolonged recovery. We'll get much more into this in later episodes, but you want to manage symptoms and start rehabilitation in tandem. Using that same cash flow analogy, we want to identify ways to cut back on those daily expenditures and find ways to make this uh, reduced budget pleasant. So we also want to find the best rehab investments for your energy. I like how you own that analogy. All right. It's hard to give specifics as they're designed on a case-by-case basis. But what should patients do in the days or weeks that follow that initial rest, especially, say, before going back to school, work, or sports? Uh, so general tips for symptom management. That's one of my favorite topics. I would say that the most important thing that you can do is to listen to your body. If, for example, you're doing something and it makes your symptoms worse, stop, don't do it, or don't do it for that long. If you're feeling fine when you're doing something, go for it. But, you know, within the limits set by your team. We have some patients who are prescribed a certain volume of cardiovascular exercise and feel those effects a little bit later. So sometimes there is a lag between the activity and symptoms. It also may take a few days to get to know your limits as your insight into what your abilities are, they might be compromised. And also you're rediscovering your neurophysiology in that post-concussion state. My recommendation for those people without the insight is to write things down. Write down what you do, how long you do it for, what the symptoms were before and after. That can help you identify the triggers for your symptoms and you can also track progress. Any other tips for managing symptoms? Yes, so the principles of energy management are key. So we'll start with prioritization. You don't have enough energy to do everything. Choose what's most important. Ask for help from family, friends, coworkers, uh, teachers or classmates, or put things off for when you're feeling better. So parents, don't make your kids do chores before they go back to school. Just let it go this one time. That wouldn't have worked with my parents, but you're getting into those four Ps. The next one is plan. Exactly. Plan things out before you do them. Anticipate the challenge. Plan to spread out your activities, especially if it's cognitively and physically demanding, throughout the day and throughout the week. We have this tendency to choose to do everything when we feel good, and it just results in that crash and burn. It's the least efficient way to manage your symptoms and your energy. So what you're saying is I shouldn't do all my errands in one go. Not after a concussion. Okay, so the next one is pacing. Okay, so really what that means is just to take breaks. It's so simple, but sometimes you have to hear it from a healthcare professional. You can best manage your concentration, your energy, your symptoms, if you take breaks. Note that that's true in everyday life, too. Breaks make you more efficient. It's why they tell you to only study for 20 minutes at a time. It sounds like this advice can be useful to many people. I agree. Okay, and final recommendations for managing symptoms? Right. Keep environment and your posture in mind when it comes to activity. Don't place yourself in environments that exacerbate symptoms or have a poor ergonomic setup. Keep your shoulders square and your chin pulled back and don't slouch. This may cause additional issues with your neck and even contribute to tension headaches. Improve your sleep. We mentioned that during the last podcast episode, so check it out if you haven't listened. But again, no need to worry if you're sleeping extra or not much at all during that initial period of rest. But these things become problems if they persist and they will need to be managed. Maintain a positive attitude, so that's the topic of our next podcast. Focus on one task at a time. Eat healthy, really just generally live a healthy lifestyle. It's interesting you say eat healthy. In this podcast series, there's been very little mention of diet, yet we all intuitively feel that what you eat will help you perform better and recover. Can you talk about this a bit more? Right, I'm going to get you to contribute on this one too. But essentially, there is minimal evidence for certain diets post-concussion. That's not to say that it's not important. It just means that it's something that's hard to study and hard to draw conclusions from. I mean, everyone has their own unique past medical history, dietary restrictions, metabolism, cultural practical considerations, and preferences. Also, another challenge is that nutritional value of food varies significantly depending on harvesting, processing, cooking procedures. Certain combinations of food have potentiating effects, whereas other combinations have negating ones. 
Thirdly, changing one's diet can involve all sorts of investments of time and money. So getting people to change something, like their diet, when time and money are tight, that's challenging. Another practical consideration is that people won't notice the effects that a change in their diet will make right away. So they might not be motivated to stick with it. Right. Well, for many of us, myself included, our diet is less than ideal right now. So why not make the change now? I can imagine the challenge uh, involved of making this change after an injury, post-concussion. I think this is why practically it hasn't received as much attention as other areas post-concussion. Although we've all heard stories of how diet can change people's lives. Yeah, I know there are many documentaries out there promoting certain diets, and many intelligent people have spent a lot of time in the study of dietetics. I know many people have looked at indigenous cultures' diets, and even diets of wild animals, and tried to study how changes in diet have been correlated with the changes in health. Is there any guidance currently on the post-concussion diet? Most of the dietary advice is kind of intuitive. So one, make sure you get enough macro and micronutrients that you would at least need if you didn't have a concussion. Now would be a good time to change any less than ideal dietary habits you have. Right. I mean, a lot of people eat too little calories or eat empty calories. So I would try to avoid things you know are likely not doing you any good. Things like alcohol or those empty calories. Things that are displacing better food choices from your diet. Uh, so try to avoid sugary foods. Uh, try to minimize caffeine. Not caffeine. Yeah, I said it. That's that's a hard recommendation for many people to stomach. But I mean, I noticed that you said minimize rather than avoid. I know the recommendation is to avoid it post-concussion. And ideally, that's what patients will do. But people who have been taking as little as 100 milligrams of caffeine per day can become dependent on it. Mm -hmm. And to stop it in one fell swoop can induce withdrawal symptoms. And many of those symptoms are similar to post-concussion syndrome symptoms. Okay, so all that advice makes a lot of sense. What about other advice? Maybe things that are less intuitive. There is a suggestion that increasing your dietary intake of certain micronutrients will help you with healing. For example, choline-rich foods like eggs, meat, poultry, fish, peanuts, dairy products, cruciferous vegetables, these things have been found to be helpful. Right, so for those of you who are not aware of what cruciferous vegetables are, uh, those are things like cauliflower, cabbage, garden cress, bok choy, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, all those delicious things. Right. Also, creatine sources like meat and fish or food with amino acids used to make creatine like uh, arginine, glycine, and methionine are also found to be helpful. Omega-3 fatty acids or alpha-linolenic acid sources like flaxseed, walnuts, canola oil, and soy are also positive to be helpful. Zinc sources are another thing felt to be helpful. You can find zinc in things like oysters, shellfish, liver, meat, poultry, and dairy products, whole grains, legumes, wheat germ, nuts, cereals, and soy products. There are also the patient's other medical issues to consider when prescribing a diet. For example, someone with post-traumatic migraines may have to introduce a few dietary changes just to help manage those symptoms. Yeah, it can get quite involved. One should consult a dietitian who is set up to work in an interdisciplinary fashion with your healthcare team. Right. So what about a ketogenic diet? There is suggestion that this may be helpful in some neurological conditions, including TBI, but more studies needed to know how to apply this on a case-by-case -case basis. There are many dietitians and naturopaths who treat people with neuroprotective diets, and intuitively it has merit. Many of the suggestions seem like a good idea, even for those without concussions. Okay. I think we've covered diet well, so let's move forwards a little bit. Well, a natural extension of diet is exercise. What about exercising before you see a healthcare team? Good question. Exercise has been shown to be helpful with concussion recovery, but the ideal exercise prescription should be identified by your healthcare team. Once you get the green light from us, we'll get you on to a return to athletics program. We always start with light aerobic activity, and there's good research out there that suggests that light aerobic activity promotes neurological recovery, but we'll speak more on this in a later podcast. Essentially, before you see that healthcare team, walking is alright, but be careful. I mean, if your balance is off, maybe you want to hold off until, you know, you come see us or make a friend and hold their arm, uh, but ideally, avoid all other activity until you see a healthcare professional. Now, Caitlin, say I'm really bored before getting back to work. What activities can I try doing? So again, everything I mentioned earlier, I mean, personally, I love to read, but I know that can be demanding on the visual system after a concussion. So one of my personal favorite recommendations is listening to audiobooks. 
Uh, and hey, if you listen to an audiobook, you could do something else at the same time, like paint your nails or color one of those adult coloring books. And uh, I hear uh, listening to podcasts can be pretty good too. Right. So what else could you do? You could begin to challenge your brain and body cautiously. So another thing I love uh, are board games. If board games don't result in symptoms, go for it. Some are simple and others really do challenge your memory, attention, planning, problem solving, creativity. Now playing risk in my family can result <laughs> in re-injury. Okay, so something a little bit safer, or maybe not, um, stretching. So you may not be able to work out the way you used to, but maybe now's the time to increase flexibility. However, if you have aches and pains already, then you should maybe consult your healthcare team before stretching indiscriminately, because stretching can make some musculoskeletal conditions worse. Although it is tempting because stretching is relaxing. So other things that you could do, maybe you're crafty or good at art. Maybe you love to cook or bake. Maybe you like puzzles or crosswords. Maybe reading doesn't cause you symptoms. Maybe now is the time to write that book, that memoir that you've always wanted to write. We had one patient who started to learn Spanish, remember? Right, yeah. So, again, every concussion is unique. Some of those things may cause you symptoms, even though they sound easy, and even if you were really good at them before. So, again, if it causes your symptoms to worsen, to get more severe, just stop. So, to wrap it up, if you can give me one piece of advice on resting, what would it be? Okay, so I've mentioned this, but it's worth saying again. Balance is key, and people really seem to struggle with balance. Some individuals strike me as overly cautious, and you've seen them too. These are the people that don't venture out, they cloister themselves in their house, they're really afraid to do anything. I think that fear might come from the fact that if they try to do something and it goes poorly, they put themselves at some great risk of not recovering. Or maybe it's a fear of failure or not performing well. Other people come in and they've been overly ambitious. Yeah, I think we are, I think we have more people that are overly ambitious. So they push through the pain and they get back to doing a lot almost immediately after the injury. I think society projects this onto us as well. We're told to be tough. We're told to push through the pain. But in this situation, blind perseverance is not the best strategy. Treat your brain well. It's, it is the most important part of your body. If you broke your leg, would you be up and doing all of those things the next day? If not, why would you do that to your brain? So, in summary, both being too cautious and pushing through the pain are not good strategies. Find a balance. Use your symptoms as a guideline. If something is making you feel worse, don't do it. But also, don't be afraid to live your life. That was a perfect summary. Thank you, Caitlin, for that education. We will continue next episode with our discussion on positivity. Thank you for listening to the Concussion 101 podcast. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe to our podcast on iTunes and leave us a review. For more information about concussion-related topics, visit us at www.yorkconcussion.ca. Stay tuned for our next episode.